Dan, um, you want to introduce yourself and talk about, uh, go ahead and talk about who you are and what you do. Sure. <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks to Hassan and Adrian for inviting me to talk to you guys today. Um, so I think what we talked about was discussing the career path of an architect, which I think is, um, it's kind of an interesting concept and I've, I've uh, I'm on the CTE Pathways Committee, and um, I think the first thing I would I would say is that um, you know a career path isn't necessarily one that has a defined destination. Um, it's kind of a unique chain of events, uh, lots of chance meetings, and uh, it's definitely not linear. And mine, it was sort of planned, but it's not something where you know where the destination is. So um, I wasn't sure how far to go back. Uh, <laughs> because it is a long chain, I'm kind of an old guy, um, but uh, I wanted to walk you through kind of what I felt were the most fulfilling moments of my, um, of my career so far. Uh, and those are also kind of the most terrifying. Um, I would say those are uh, definitely the, uh, the scary moments too, because they're, they're the firsts. So um, <clears throat> I called this talk Practicing Architecture Still because architecture and design uh, are uh, kind of nonlinear processes in themselves. There's a lot of trial and error. And uh, so I say practicing architecture still because I'm, I'm still trying to get it right. So um, I figured I would take you back to kind of when I took a career compatibility test when I was uh, in, in 1983. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, 1987, uh, when I was 14 years old. You guys, Adrian has probably uh, done these with you guys. They're, they were questions like, do you like being outside all day? Uh, do you like being around other people? Um, and so I took this test and uh, the number one option for me came up as an agricultural engineer, which um, I'm, I sunburn very easily and I'm not really good with plants. So uh, that wasn't really the, the best choice for me, I didn't think, but there was on that list uh, architect. Um, and I didn't really know what an architect did at the time, uh, and sometimes I feel like I still don't know. Um, but um, I took a trip to Falling Water in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, near where I went to high school in Mechanicsburg, and um, it really uh, inspired me. You know, it, it was, it's such a beautiful building, and it's so integrated with its surroundings. And I thought to myself, this is something I could um, I could get into. Uh, it's a really a, a generalist profession uh, as opposed to a specialist profession. Um, so in high school, I was kind of good at a lot of things, but not really great at anything. So I didn't want to go to a very specialized profession like, um, you know, being a specialized doctor or a specific kind of engineer. So uh, architecture appealed to me. Um, but we at my high school, we didn't really have a, uh, a CTE program and I didn't have a uh, there wasn't an architecture program like what you guys have. Um, so what, what I ended up doing was I took uh, drafting classes. Uh, this is not one of my, my drawings on screen, but um, I did do a lot of uh, technical drawings of machine parts. Uh, and it kind of introduced me to the idea of measured drawings uh, and not just measured in the sense that they're to scale, which they were, but also how to thoughtfully kind of put together and uh, consider a drawing uh, as an anticipation of, of building. <clears throat> and still to this day, uh, drawing is at the heart of my practice. And also uh, I'm still kind of fascinated with, with hardware. So that was high school. Um, and after high school, I applied for uh, undergraduate architecture at University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, that was a, a four-year non-professional degree. And what I mean by that is uh, I came out with a Bachelor of Science in Architecture. And to be licensed, you need to have a Bachelor's of Architecture. Um, so some would argue, uh, including uh, Asan and, and my uh, colleague at the LAID, Bill Taylor, they would say that's not necessarily your best value. Uh, but I had a strong belief in a, a liberal arts education as a path to becoming a a well-rounded person and uh, a good citizen. Um, at UVA, the uh, the teaching, at least at the time, was that um, you know basically it's uh, the most famous building is shown here on the upper left, the rotunda at the lawn, uh, and there was an idea of an academical village, kind of based on neoclassical ideas, uh, democratic ideals. 
Uh, and for me, um, my education there was foundational. It was uh, basically a, an education in, in the rules of architecture, that there are, are certain things like proportion, symmetry, balance, and rhythm uh, that you needed to uh, conform to. Um, and you can see uh, down at the bottom, this Richmond Row Houses project is pretty, uh, uh, pretty typical of that, um, where basically they're, it's fairly, uh, fairly realistic, let's say, and also very measured, and uh, it kind of evokes the firmness, commodity, and delight that were um, the principles that Vitruvius, uh, <clears throat> the ancient um, thinker, kind of believed that good architecture all had. So that was my undergrad. Um, and then I went on and basically because I had to, I knew I had to go to grad school, I wanted to take a pause between undergrad and grad school and work in the profession for a while. Um, so I moved to Baltimore and then to Washington DC. Uh, I graduated in 95 uh, and straight into a, a deep recession where there weren't many jobs in architecture. But I eventually found a job at uh, um, uh, uh, Skidmore Owings in Maryland, DC. And after a year there, I went on to a firm called The Core Group. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, this, this photo on the left here, uh, I'm not that old, that's from the 60s, but I, I like these kind of vintage photographs of architecture offices, um, just in, in the fact that they uh, kind of show how much drawing was important and, and basically people kind of lived on their drawing boards. Um, let's see, so DC is an industry town, uh, similar to LA, although there the, the industry is government. Uh, and so there's kind of a steady supply of, um, of work, mostly renovation work, uh, lots of law firms and uh, association lobbyist offices. Um, they also, there's a height limit in effect for Washington DC. Uh, basically no, no building can be taller than the Washington Monument. So you end up with lots of office space. It's fairly uniform, uh, nine foot floor to floor heights. So um, it's kind of a good place to start as an architect because the uh, each project or lots of projects have similar uh, constraints. Okay. Um, so, to talk about my first experience in DC, I worked at SOM, Skidmore Owings and Merrill. Um, this was kind of my first real job after school. Um, and I started in interior architecture there. Uh, again, with it being a renovation market, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of tenant improvements for office space, which is what, what it's called when you come into uh, a lease space and build it out for a particular client. So, um, Interior is a good place to start for architects, I think, um, because I did, so <laughs> of course they think that. Um, they, the pace of the projects tends to be quicker than with uh, ground up or larger projects. Uh, the teams are small, so you get a lot of responsibility. Um, there tend to be a lot of details to work out in, in that short amount of time, but uh, the issues are relatively simple. Um, so <clears throat> the, uh, the first on the left up here is, uh, Recording Industry Association of America, again, a, a lobbyist office for uh, the music industry. Uh, and yes, I did do all the drawings for that project by hand. Uh, I am that old. Uh, but that was an exciting project because a lot of the, uh, the projects in DC were, were very conservative. So you, you had law firms that wanted to look like uh, a Georgian, uh, Georgian house with crown and base. Uh, but this one was very modern uh, and for DC, it was pretty exciting. And this, this one was uh, uh, published in Interior Design Magazine, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, and then down on the right um, is a project I worked on for about three months called the First National Bank of Maryland uh, in Baltimore. And this was a, a flagship branch. Um, so I spent uh, several months kind of documenting the existing conditions, doing these measured drawings of the existing space and putting together presentation to convince uh, their board to uh, create this flagship office because they were, um, they were getting a lot of competition from non-local branches like Bank of America and such. And uh, the idea was that they would reassert uh, the fact that this was their hometown and this, is, this was their headquarters. Um, and so 
I wasn't invited to that final presentation. Uh, and basically when my, my boss told me that, uh, that basically they didn't sell the project, they, uh, the board decided that they didn't want to do it, uh, I, I quit right there. <laughs> the passion of youth, right? I was so passionate about uh, the, this project being the right thing and, and upset by the fact that I wasn't invited to the meeting to try to pitch it, um, that I was like, it's time to move on. <laughs> uh, so uh, my next job was with a, a small uh, and pretty progressive architecture firm there called The Core Group. Uh, again, lots of interior projects. And uh, this, uh, this project that I have on screen uh, was a small public relations, uh, public relations firm called Smart Team. Uh, and this was the first project where I was basically assigned to do the entire project, soup to nuts, uh, all the client meetings. I designed the layout, the partition, the detailing, the furniture, the fabrics, everything. Um, and I think, you know, I, I thought I was pretty flattered because I was like, wow, they really trust me. Probably part of it is that they didn't really have a big enough fee to put anybody else on it. Uh, but it was it was a first for me, and it was really exciting. And I put I put a lot of time into it, a lot of time uh, that I didn't build just because I wanted it to be as good as it possibly could. Um, this was also in in terms of recording first. This was also the first time that I was yelled at by a contractor because I did all the the construction administration. So when I went out and I told the contractor that the carpet had to be at a specific angle because the furniture uh, was uh basically placed based on the the carpet angle he said well what the hell am i supposed to bring a protractor to the site and then uh, stormed off and yelled uh expletive college boy <laughs> so that was that was a pretty great moment in my career um then uh while i was at core one of my colleagues uh approached me and said that he had a a client who wanted to do uh, a nightclub um, and asked if I wanted to uh, to help him on it to basically design it together and again being uh, young and uh, <laughs> probably not very smart I said sure that sounds like fun so um, basically up on the upper left here uh, is the project that we did together after hours again uh, moonlighting is not necessarily something I would recommend but I, I definitely uh, partook at that point in my career. So uh, this 1223 nightclub uh, was our first nightclub project. Um, we essentially just removed a section of the second floor of this old uh, fabric store, uh, built this um, bridge. Can you explain to them what moonlighting is? Sure, yeah, so um, moonlighting is basically, you go to your day job, uh, you do the projects that you're assigned, and then when you go home, you work on side side jobs, side projects that, um, you know, in this case, it was uh, my my former colleague or my colleague, Michael, had, uh, had gotten this client to do this nightclub. Uh, probably what we should have done was taken it to our bosses and said, hey, we're bringing in this project, but we were young and, uh, and ambitious, so we, we went ahead and did it ourselves. Um, so, the 1223 nightclub on the upper left, we essentially just removed uh, removed a portion of the floor, built the steel uh, uplit bridge across, and put in these uplit uh, fabric curtains, and that was kind of the whole project. Um, it was very, <laughs> a little bit painful in terms of how we had to do it, because we were up till, you know, one o'clock in the morning uh, for months, uh, just doing this after hours. Uh, but it turned into a successful nightclub and it led to more projects, um, not while I was in DC, but basically after I'd moved out here, I still worked uh, with my former partner. Uh, and that was, uh, got a lot of good nightclub uh, and restaurant experience through that. Uh, then in 1998, uh, I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, and to go to grad school at Southern California Institute of Architecture. Um, that's, it's downtown now, but at the time it was uh, in Playa, Playa Vista or near where Playa Vista is now on Beethoven. Um, and I really wanted to, um, to find an experience that was uh, kind of a counterpoint to my education at UVA, the, the fundamentals that I learned there, and also kind of the conservative <clears throat> culture at 
uh, in, in, in DC uh, that I experienced uh, during work experience there. Um, and so Cyric was the perfect place. Um, at the time, it was very, uh, very exciting because there were a lot of divergent uh, and diverse perspectives there. There were people who were, um, even though this was 1998, they were uh, doing parametric uh, computer modeling, basically kind of growing architecture out of algorithms. Uh, and there were, but there were still people who uh, had a passion for hand drawing. Uh, I still gravitated towards uh, towards the drawing practice and uh, found a, a generous mentor in uh, Perry Culper, who now is at uh, University of Michigan. And he really helped me expand my conceptual range. So, um, and what I mean by that is that architecture can be about more than just uh, buildings and how they're put together. Um, for example, like some of the drawings on here uh, were, were done just with light and photography. And uh, so it was a lot of more, more like opening doors rather than, uh, than answering questions necessarily. Um, I also uh, was privileged to work with uh, the shop master uh, at the time, whose name was Randall Stout. He was a, a master cabinet maker trained in England. And uh, he taught me um, some great things about making. Um, on the lower, I guess, lower middle here, there's a, a stool that I made where um, I cast those aluminum pieces from molds that I made. That's uh, called that the cowboy toast stool. So um, it was a great place. I mean, it was it was kind of a, a, a perfect place for me to complement my undergraduate uh, education. So what's next, next after school? So I went uh, undergrad for four years and then worked for three years and then two and a half years of grad school. Um, so the natural progression or the typical progression is uh, you get licensed as an architect. Um, so licensure and uh, this process has changed uh, over the past, I guess, 16 years since I've been licensed. Uh, but at the time, uh, there was an intern development program where you basically log hundreds of hours working on specific types of tasks under a licensed architect. Um, and then there, there were nine tests at the time, nine individual tests. Each uh, was about 300 bucks a piece at the time. <clears throat> and at the time, there was also a California oral examination where you had to go um, kind of creepy into a hotel room with three uh, registered architects and they would ask you questions about a conceptual project. Um, the California oral does not exist anymore, um, but uh, the whole process took me probably about two and a half years. Uh, I was licensed by 30, but um, I will say that uh, my personal feeling is that the, the whole IDP process and all of the stuff that you have to do for licensure it's a little bit of a scam. I mean, uh, it's basically the AIA, NCARB, all these organizations kind of protecting firm owners from young architects uh, and basically at the expense of young architects. <clears throat> but uh, I, I still went through it, but I, I'm still not a, an AIA member uh, because I, I kind of disagree with, uh, with that process. It's also, um, it's also uh, interesting to mention at this point, sorry to cut you off, Sean, hmm. that, um, Part of the way that the old generation of architects protect the um, this system is that you can actually um, you could be fined or um, th there's certain repercussions, legal repercussions, very serious ones if you advertise yourself as an architect with a capital A. <laughs> yeah, and, and you don't and you don't have a valid license, meaning that. Even if you went to architecture school for five years or, and then, or got a master's after seven years, eight years, even if you worked as an architect for you know, 40 years after that, it doesn't matter. You can't legally, publicly, by law, call yourself an architect unless you log in those 3,000 hours, pay them 100 bucks a year, pay the whatever $1,000 you're gonna have to pay to take those nine tests and go through all the bureaucracy and all of that for the piece of paper that the government gives you. So. There are some people acting to remove that um, criminal violation, uh, but but yeah, so that that's kind of the yeah. reason why architects in society aren't moving forward is because you know the organizations that are designed to help and protect them are mostly antagonistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, 
it's kind of a silly thing. Basically, uh, if you say architectural designer or um, yeah, architect, you put any of that on advertisement, then you'll get a, a citation from the California Architects Board. And I think it's a $1,500 fine. Um, so I, I think the, the, the way to, uh, to help this is to get involved. You know, like there is a, a student uh, chapter of the AIA, AIA, if you got involved and tried to change that culture, that would be good. Uh, but yeah, or you could just be a conscientious objector like me and just not join the AIA. Uh, go through the process and get your architecture stamp. And then I have uh, I've been a IDP supervisor for a lot of former employees, uh, and I would basically just <laughs> I would tell them whatever categories you need, just put the hours down in those categories, and I'll sign it because uh, it's kind of a scam. Um, but uh, anyway, back to kind of the uh, life after school so there there's the whole intern development program and licensure process it's there, there are hurdles that are in place to keep young architects uh, from competing with older architects but uh, just get through it as quickly as you can so that you can uh, you can go ahead and compete especially if you work harder than than they do um, can, you ex can you explain to them sean what which kinds of projects require a license and and what percentage of architects working in the practice actually get licensed, even though they've been working for a long time, just so they have an idea of like, what's the purpose of a license, maybe explain the litigation behind it and what the, how putting your stamp has liability attached to it and that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with the percentage of architects or people working in architecture who um, don't get licensed, uh, but uh, the state of California, basically you can design a one family or a two family dwelling with, without an architecture license. Anyone in the state uh, can do that. You can't call yourself an architect when you're doing that, but you could call yourself something like a house designer. Uh, any commercial project and any residential project that is over, um, that is more than, uh, than a duplex, you're required to have a license for. Um, and that's not to say you can't do that stuff, but you would have to involve a, an architect to, to help make sure that your project is code compliant and to stamp your plans. And stamping your plans basically um, is saying that you have taken responsible control is the, the technical term, meaning that you don't necessarily have to do the drawings yourself, but you check them, make sure they're in compliance with code. Uh, and yes, there's liability associated with stamping someone's plans. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of buildings that, uh, that get built that don't necessarily have an architect attached, like uh, warehouses and uh, farm buildings and things like that. They still are going to require um, a structural engineer stamp on them, but um, there are plenty of buildings that get built without architects. Um, <clears throat> but I will say that the, the people I know who've worked in the profession for a long time, like I know a guy who's almost 70, he's been uh, working as a designer that whole time. Uh, but can't really call himself an architect. It does limit you um, in terms of what you can do. And uh, the tests aren't really that that hard. They're just tedious. So all, all it's supposed to demonstrate is like entry level understanding of architecture. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that further, uh, maybe in the Q&A session. Um, <clears throat> but I would say if, if you're thinking about uh, becoming an architect or a designer, there's no reason not to get licensed because uh, once you do, then you, you have more options in terms of what you can design by yourself. Um, so uh, in the time that I had after, or in my work experience after uh, grad school, um, I essentially, I, I worked at once one firm called Space International for about a year. Um, I worked on a house, a retail shop, and did uh, uh, mixed, uh, uh, construction administration on a mixed use building, which is basically where you go and meet with the contractor and talk about, <clears throat> you know, what they've done wrong. It's you're basically just making sure they're building per plan. <clears throat> uh, and then after that, um, I moved to a firm called Design Arc, which uh, probably is where I had my most professional growth. I uh, got a lot of opportunities to work on all kinds of different projects, uh, housing, retail, hospitality, office, uh, and more. Um, I'm still grateful for the, all the opportunities that my, uh, my bosses there gave me. Um, they, they trusted me with a lot of stuff they probably shouldn't have trusted me with. Uh, and I've also, that was also where I, 
uh, met my current partner, Fincho Wajatno, uh, and we overlapped for 13 years there. So um, we, we had the experience or the opportunity to work together for a long time on lots of different types of projects. Um, so to go through some of those, um, the, the projects that I worked on. So uh, I still worked in hospitality. So building on the restaurant and nightclub projects uh, that I had done before, um, I was running the hospitality studio at Design Arc. So we did a lot of restaurants, uh, some of them in an executive architecture function, uh, architect function, which is uh, a little bit tied into what Asan was asking about. If you're an interior designer and you want to do a restaurant, you can, but you need to work with an architect who will mind the code issues. So the, the fire resistance of uh, the different assemblies, um, you know, coordination with MEP consultants, um, code compliance, egress, all those things. Um, so mm, on the left here, there are two Ketsi is one in Bahrain uh, and one in Dubai that I worked on. Um, a bit, I think I, I tried to count last night. I think I did about two dozen locations of Katsia. Uh, the first one, uh, Philippe Stark, who is the interior designer for the concept, uh, was involved. But then basically the next 23 were us taking that kit of parts and kind of uh, redeploying them in different situations. Um, we also did some uh, some work that was kind of one-off, which I would say like a unique restaurant, like the Ketsu is a chain or franchise restaurant. Uh, whereas uh, we did a few that were uh, one-offs, meaning a unique uh, project. So Paiche and Marina Del Rey um, basically was our design, uh, obviously always in collaboration with clients. Uh, Moza Pizzeria, we worked with uh, the Moza people's internal team to do that one. And then Somni Restaurant in Beverly Hills, um, uh, which is super high-end, uh, kind of prefix, uh, only 10 seats in the whole restaurant. Um, and that, um, that we did in collaboration with the Spanish uh, designer. Uh, and that's uh, on the right there. <clears throat> and then so the, the context that I, uh, I built up from working on the restaurant projects um, I capitalized on those to get some small hotel jobs. Um, so hotels, uh, just like any other business, are always kind of tweaking their operations uh, to get more revenue. So uh, basically, <clears throat> uh, I've done like satellite kitchens, like little 500 square foot kitchens to get closer to a certain area, uh, pool bars, uh, refreshing, like going in and working with an interior designer to uh, renovate all the rooms, basically to refresh the, the design of the rooms. Uh, and then what I have on screen here is a uh, retractable roof uh, on a 4,000 square foot event space at the SLS Hotel in Beverly Hills. Um, and so this one is, you know, the architecture is kind of backgrounded, right? Because you, you want the, uh, the space and the event to kind of uh, take precedence, but that was, uh, that was a pretty, pretty interesting project. <clears throat> Um, and then, so the small hotel jobs uh, led to some big hotel jobs, uh, like this one on screen. So um, this was a master plan and design of a 45-acre resort in the Coachella Valley. Um, there were 360 keys, a conference center, food and beverage uh, components, um, and 62 buildings to design. Um, basically unique building types to design. Um, so Finch and I worked on this one together and we managed a team of, of six through, um, I think we got through about 50% design development. Uh, and that means, uh, so you have the schematic design, you have the, the uh, concept design for the building, and then you have to work with engineers and uh, different consultants to refine that design and make it more and more real until the point where you issue construction documents, which um, First, you need to get them approved by the city, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then once they say you have a building permit, then you start building off of those. Um, so this one didn't make it through 50%, or it, it was put on hold after 50% DD, uh, probably because the <laughs> they didn't secure the the purchase of the land uh, of the the lower 30 acres of the parcel before they started talking to people about it. So. The seller, for some reason, didn't want to sell it to them as cheaply. Yeah, 
So in, in my experience, I found that the bigger the project, uh, the more possibility it is that it just won't go through because there, there's so much, uh, so many potential issues that come up. <clears throat> um, and then uh, the, the other main sector, and this is where um, uh, Finch and I collaborated the most, I would say, is uh, multifamily housing. Um, so uh, basically, Finch and I, in the 13 years that we overlapped at the Design Arc, we helped build uh, over a thousand units of um, of housing. We we have a, a severe housing shortage in California. We've underbuilt housing uh, for at least the past uh, 60, uh, 50 or 60 years. Um, so we we worked on many many projects together, and this this is probably well this was the first high density one that we worked on together. Again. Um, it's pretty terrifying to kind of uh, be working on your first big project and it, it to be uh, one of this scale. But <clears throat> um, so this is what we would call a podium uh, podium project where you have wood buildings on top of a concrete uh, garage, uh, which is a pretty common thing for apartments in uh, in Southern California. They're also incredibly complicated because you have all kinds of different um, uh, construction types. Uh, and also this project had a lot of other regulatory overlays, meaning uh, uh, plant or like uh, government regulations. So there was a design review uh, process that we had to go through. Uh, there were, um, it's in a methane zone. It was required to be uh, LEED certified, which is a, a green building certification program. Um, so incredibly complicated project. And so this was about, uh, I think from 2008 is when we started started working on it in earnest to 2012. So four years of our lives were spent working on this almost full time. Um, but the, the, unique, the uniqueness of this project was it was 2008 when they started, uh, or 2009 uh, when they started building it. So it was deep in, in the heart of, of the, the recession. <clears throat> and so we got a lot of value for, uh, for the construction costs. So these, uh, expansive, you know, huge uh, Junior Olympic size pool. Uh, these these great uh, common spaces uh, are not very common for uh, for apartment buildings in LA. Uh, and some of that was also like uh, we were new to it, so we wanted to make it as as great as we possibly could. And usually that's that's where those first because you're so uh, terrified of of failing, <laughs> you tend to do a really really good job. Um, and then. There were also a lot of projects that we worked on together that were never built. Um, so on the left here, there's a, a condominium tower uh, study. This is, I think we, I had a former student come to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm partnered with a, a guy in Brazil who wants to build these condo towers uh, near the Helebras facility in, in Brazil, in Itajuba. Uh, and so we did this uh, two week charrette project to uh, present that to him. And, uh, and then on the right, we have uh, Little Italy Apartments in San Diego, really uh, difficult site, kind of irregularly shaped site and lots of grade change. So very difficult project, uh, but kind of, oh, sorry. Uh, but we, we kind of uh, leverage those constraints to create a pretty unique project with these buried amenity spaces that uh, kind of opened up to the light, kind of like uh, Rudolph's. Yale Art and Architecture uh, uh, building. Um, so what, what I found was, and the reason I wanted to show some unbuilt projects is, um, the longer I was working on the multifamily, the more the unbuilt projects became my favorites because they were never compromised. Uh, they were never kind of uh, sullied by, uh, by the fact that you had to make them real. Um, so that was maybe not a great sign. And um, so eventually, uh, and this was the last project that Finch and I uh, developed or designed and uh, and detailed for our last firm. Uh, and this is uh, right near the Fashion Valley Mall in San Diego. Um, so just to kind of walk you through a case study of, of the long process of a multifamily project. Uh, on the upper left, you see uh, the rendering uh, that in this case, uh, our bosses, uh, kind of develop the image of the building, what they wanted it to look like. Uh, and then 
got it approved by the city and by the client, uh, just in terms of its uh, schematic design. And then basically for the next four months, Finch and I worked on, basically took the whole thing apart and put it back together again uh, to make sure everything uh, worked in terms of code compliance, uh, coordinated it with the engineers, um, and basically just to give you an idea and again it's still about drawing right like the only thing as architects that we deliver are, is a set of drawings so just to give you an idea this is the sheet index for that set uh, we had 176 architectural sheets and these are not small sheets they're three feet wide uh, three four feet wide by three feet tall um, and then there were 600 sheets total so each of those uh, sets of drawings or each of those drawings uh, we would have to put our eyes on every sheet of the consultant drawings, look for things that were wrong. Uh, and usually with the developer project, they hire cheap engineers. So there's usually a lot of things wrong. Uh, and then you send them back the comments. And then six weeks later, you, you issue another set uh, and basically go through the whole, whole process over again. Hopefully it's getting more developed and more buildable each time, but it is, um, it's a lot of work and it can be a little bit soul crushing. Uh, but then you basically submit those drawings to uh, the city for plan check, in this case, city of, of San Diego, go through four to six months of uh, negotiation uh, where they come and they say, this is not, uh, this is not compliant with code or this. And there's usually, I think San Diego has like 30 different departments that you have to submit to. So you have to get all those people on board, uh, have them sign off and say, okay, go ahead and build it. Um, and I wanted to share this video of, uh, kind of where where the at least the first half of the building process. So um, this is them clearing and preparing the site, doing the grading. They had to do a lot of uh, uh, soil remediation here. They basically drove stone piles. Here you see the garage being built, um, and the podium portion, which is basically the concrete portion uh, to the left there. Um, there, they're pouring the slab on grade for the other half of the residential. Uh, and so this video, uh, I think it was till uh, the end of last month, uh, represents about half of the time uh, of construction. So about three years to, to build this from the ground up. And each, basically, you're going to the site uh, at least every other week, if not every week. And the contractors are telling you all the things that they either didn't build per plan or they don't think are right about your plan. So um, I think all in all, this project will probably be done in 2022. So again, five years of your life. Um, so that kind of leads me to, uh, to where I am now or where, where uh, Finch and I are now, which is uh, we got to the point where, um, I don't know if you've heard of this phrase, uh, this phrase advancing to your misery. Uh, like when you have about you know, 20 years of experience in a profession, um, you end up not really doing any of the things that drew, drew you to the profession, right? So, um, you know, you're, you're talking to people on the phone, you're answering emails, but I wasn't doing any of the drawing, I wasn't doing any of the design, or I wasn't doing enough of the design. I found myself, uh, you know, reserving an hour of each day just to work on a detail because it was the only thing that really gave me fulfillment. Um, so, um, I decided it was time to move on. Um, so, um, Basically, I, uh, Finch and I had lunch one day and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't really do the multifamily anymore. I, I want to move off on my own. Asked her if she, she wanted to, to do it. And she said, yep, let's do it. Uh, didn't take her long, she said that day. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess the question is, is starting your firm a promotion or a demotion? And I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I would say uh, we're probably working 25% more than we did for 25% less money, but uh, personally, I'm, I'm about 50% happier, so uh, I'll take that. Um, and we're, we, we're basically doing everything. So we're sharing all the responsibilities, so all the design, all the drawing, uh, project management, uh, talking to clients, talking to contractors, talking to consultants, uh, business development. So we're going out and we're uh, meeting people, shaking hands, trying to get new work. Um, you got to kiss a lot of frogs, uh, as, as we like to say, uh, and also doing all the accounting. So it's, uh, it's a lot more, lot more work, but it's a pretty diverse workload. Uh, and we've been really lucky in that we've gotten uh, very diverse projects. So 
we still have the hospitality work, at least for now. Um, not a lot of people are, are building restaurants right now, but um, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but luckily, we're not just uh, restaurant architects. Uh, we also do single family custom homes, um, uh, which I'll show you a couple of. Um, we also didn't want to shed our multifamily or, or not uh, capitalize on our multifamily. So we're also doing peer review uh, for multifamily projects, which I'll talk about, um, about that in more detail on another couple slides. And we've gotten some really unusual projects that I never would have dreamed of. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I guess this is me and this is uh, my partner, Fincha. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So this is the first project that we got. I essentially, the, um, the week that I was leaving Design Arc, I got a call on my personal cell phone and uh, it was from a former VP of the Katsuya restaurant group or uh, uh, the group that, that owned the Katsuya brand. And he said, I've started my own uh, restaurant firm and I want you, I want to do all my projects through you. And I said, uh, let me call you back in a week. <laughs> so this is the first project we did, which is a, a food hall in Santa Monica called Social Eats. Uh, it's kind of an interesting concept because he wanted to be able to uh, sign one lease, but then swap out food concepts. Uh, if they were successful, great. If they weren't, he could basically interchange it with something. So very attractive to landlords. Um, so this was the, the movie we made of that uh, kind of with the framework and then the brands inserted into it. Uh, and then here's some, some finished uh, pictures of that. Um, so uh, the framework that we imagined was basically these white marble die walls and the, um, the black frames. Um, and then basically the brands got inserted into that. And uh, the proof of that concept was we had Fuku come in about a month before we were supposed to open it. And we inserted them into the mix and, and everything worked fine. Uh, and then I mentioned we also do uh, single family uh, custom residential. So this is kind of a staple of uh, young uh, Southern California offices. Um, basically a lot of them start off with a house or they start off with a couple of houses. So, uh, luckily, I have friends who are willing to take a chance on, on us. Uh, Fincha has a lot of great single family uh, experience, so uh, more than I do. And so it wasn't that much of a chance. But um, the first two that we've done, one is a, uh, an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit in Culver City um, that you see on the upper, uh, upper row there. Um, so ADUs are accessory dwelling units. The state of California is really pushing ADUs hard because uh, it's a way of basically increasing density in these uh, low density neighborhoods uh, by uh, letting people uh, build a second unit in the back and not provide parking for it. So a lot of people are building ADUs right now. Um, and then on the lower portion is uh, a, a second story addition in Hancock Park. And unfortunately, well, um, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but both of these are a little constrained because uh, the city of Culver City told us we had to match the front house. Uh, so you can kind of see this is trying to demonstrate that. Match what the front house looks like with the back house. And here this is uh, Hancock Park House is in a historic overlay zone. So they, we basically went to, I think, three meetings of that before they kind of uh, would accept uh, what, we, what we had designed for that. Um, so we're... Uh, Obviously, we're going to keep doing houses. They're great because the program or the, the technical constraints aren't that, uh, they're not that difficult, not like restaurants where you're having to deal with a lot of uh, mechanical and electrical and plumbing issues. Uh, so it's a good way to kind of test ideas. So we're hoping to get one that uh, maybe isn't required to be historic. <laughs> um, so I mentioned the peer review. So this is a little unusual, you know, uh, we have a lot of experience, you know, combined, uh, what, 35 or 40 years of experience doing multifamily projects. Um, they're very complex and there's a lot of code issues when you put that many people in a high density wood building. Um, so to leverage that experience, we, we don't want to do uh, the entire uh, process where you have to do all the coordination with consultants, but we've done it so many times that we have knowledge there that we wanted to be able to um, to sell. 
So uh, we work with uh, some developer friends uh, that we've worked with, that we worked with at our previous firm, and uh, we'll say, you'll charge them an hourly rate and they will send us a set of drawings that they want us to look at and say, hey, uh, point out any code issues. So uh, all of the blue and pink and yellow and all these things here, that's all us pointing out uh, things that could potentially be issues. So whether it's uh, egress, which is how people get out of the building, uh, constructability, uh, fire rating based on the distance of the property line. So instead of just completely abandoning the multifamily world, we've found a way to uh, basically capitalize on the experience we have. And I've redacted the, the names of, uh, <laughs> for, for protection of the innocent there. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, the last type of projects that, uh, that we're working on are projects we would never even know exist. Um, so on the top here, we're basically, uh, we're currently in plan check and about to start construction on a meditation center uh, in a former uh, post office in Van Nuys. Um, so this one's very unusual and it's a very unique project. And honestly, there's not a lot of, um, you know, a lot of great moments where you can show like a rendering, like, oh, look how cool it is, because most of the work there is doing these diagrams of code compliance, like, oh, this works to be a business occupancy because A, B, C, and D. So there's a lot of drawings in the set like this, uh, but we're always looking for design opportunities. So here uh, at the top of this, uh, this hip here, there are these existing skylights that currently are completely blocked off from the interior. So our big design move in this project is uh, opening up the attic floor uh, to let that light in and creating this new, um, I would say it's kind of a deco stair, like it's a 1930s New Deal uh, post office. So we tried to respect that by doing a, a slightly, uh, slightly deco, art deco stair. And then on the bottom here is, uh, a project that just finished construction uh, that is a pet compounding pharmacy. So uh, basically a, a veterinary pharmacy where they mix their own uh, drugs for pets, uh, which I never knew existed until we got this project, but we got it through a contractor friend of ours. Uh, and there's not really a lot of program there. It's essentially just uh, one highly controlled environment, which is this box right here. It's the compounding room. So that has to be at a particular negative pressure uh, and uh, be closely monitored and all the finishes have to be uh, to meet certain uh, cleanability requirements <clears throat> but we still look for those design opportunities so for us in this one it was really kind of about the composition of of these windows so um, again not necessarily the most glamorous project but it was a first right like your first pet compounding pharmacy is always the best <laughs> um, and then uh, like Asan, uh, and actually the, the, uh, how I met Asan, I'm also a, a teacher. Uh, two nights a week, I teach a hand drawing class. Uh, the past few months, obviously that's been online, um, but this is one of our reviews. Uh, this is me when I was, uh, had better personal grooming, and uh, uh, that's me, I guess, trying to figure out how my hands go together, maybe unsuccessfully. Um, <clears throat> but I do, I do projects with uh, my students like, uh, transformation exercises where we take paintings or our existing plant and we analyze them and, and transform them into a, a new figure ground composition. Uh, and then we, um, well, one, one of the specific briefs is then you take this information and you create a, uh, a new uh, three-dimensional volumetric proposal by taking one of these and putting them on the bottom and one on the back and seeing how those interact in space. Uh, Boolean operations, you guys probably know that from working with Hassan. <laughs> wow, doesn't that look familiar? Yeah, <laughs> it should, right? Um, and then, so just to kind of bring it all together. So um, the thing that's interesting about an architecture degree is uh, it's not necessarily like a straight path. I talked about kind of, uh, chains of events and random happenings and a lot of stuff that you're, you're not controlling on this path. Uh, but with an architecture degree, it's actually, um, you can do a lot of different things. I mean, you know from Asan, he does a lot of interesting uh, event exhibit design, branding, um, but just to kind of give you a, an idea of the people that I've known or that I've gone to school with, 
about 50%, I would say, went on to become architects. But even within being an architect, you can be residential, commercial, healthcare, retail, all kinds of different, uh, <clears throat> different sectors you can work in. I've been lucky enough to not be pigeonholed where I've been able to work on multiple types of projects, which honestly makes, uh, makes things a lot, uh, a lot less uh, dreary. Um, <clears throat> But also, you know, I know interior architects, uh, planners, uh, preservationists, educators, obviously Asan and myself, uh, also, you know, related fields, but not necessarily directly related, well, uh, related, uh, like general contractors, or you could be an estimator, figuring out how much a project would cost, landscape architects, graphic designers, my wife went to both undergrad and grad with me, and she is a graphic and web designer, uh, video game designers, Structural engineers, you can go over to the dark side, like meaning <laughs> make a lot more money, but be sitting on the other side of the table and represent the owner, be basically a client's representative. I also know composers, photographers, artists, you name it. So um, it is, it is a, an education or a degree that, that could potentially take you down a lot of different paths because it kind of trains you to think in a certain type of way. Uh, very analytical, trying to work through a, prob a problem. Uh, both from the artist's and the engineer's perspective. Um, and that's, that's all I had to say. It's a little longer than I was hoping to talk, but uh, I think we still have a little bit of time for some Q&A if you guys uh, had any questions. I actually have a question. Um, you mentioned you're, you're going to be, that was really good information, even though I'm not into architecture. I mean, this is really great. Um, go to sites like even as like out of the country are you going to the are you flying out to the different where were you going out to the different countries every week or every other week like the other big projects yeah so um that's a really good question so the international work that i've done has only been those katsuya projects so i think i did mm, 12 maybe maybe 12 to 16 i forget exactly uh, but we were essentially the Katsuya is owned by a local, um, a local lifestyle company called SBE, and they sold the rights to a, um, to a, 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 a conglomerate in, um, in Kuwait called Al Shaya, and they basically wanted to open uh, three to four a year. So I would go out, uh, it was basically once a quarter, so once every three months, I would fly to the Middle East and I would visit multiple sites. So, um, and it depended on kind of what they were looking at. So some of them, uh, like I basically went to Kuwait, uh, Dubai, uh, Qatar, Egypt, um, Bahrain, uh, and I think there are a couple more. But so each time I would take a week and um, sometimes I would do six different countries in a week, <laughs> which, <laughs> Those were tough trips because basically the uh, the plane ride over was 16 hours if I got a direct flight, and then I would sometimes be in a country like Egypt. I was I visited Egypt for three and a half hours, uh, and then got back on a plane and went to the to the next site. So, yeah, usually those projects I would go out and see the site uh, before it was built. Uh, I would come back to uh, check on kind of the the layout when they have the partitions up and they don't have drywall or any of the finishes on. And then I would come back when it was done. So each site I would, I would visit three times, but when, you know, it, when it was, when we had the, it up and running the, you know, we're doing four to six a year. Um, those were, those were long trips. <laughs> yeah. And is there a favorite type of building that you are, um, that you ha want to design or your favorite one to, to design? Um, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say that there's a favorite necessarily because for me, it's, it's mostly in the, um, in the diversity of the work, right? So I think if I worked on like, um, it's not gonna be a problem right now because no one's building restaurants, but if we only did restaurants, I would get sick of restaurants pretty quick. But uh, if we, you know, if I can basically work on um, a single family home on Monday and then on Tuesday work on a commercial project and then uh, 
Wednesday kind of do peer review. That's kind of what keeps it interesting for me is the, the variety. Um, so I, I think that's almost, uh, it's kind of rare, I would say. I think most architects, they get pigeonholed and they, uh, they're known for one thing. Uh, like I actually worked with my, the first job I had in, uh, I had a, a job for a few months in Baltimore working for a, a firm that did malls in Indonesia. And there was a guy at that firm that all he did every day was he drew the long section through malls. So he drew the same type of drawing every day for 20 years. And I think I would, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't last long. To piggyback on that, I think sometimes firms that are organized or, um, you know, managed better, they kind of understand this um, philosophy. So younger architects or intermediate architects in their office, they try to shift them around. So like if you're working on a few houses for a few months, then they might put you on a team that's working on a park. And then once that's done, then they'll put you on something else, or they might even shift you throughout the week. So like a few days you're working on something with a more advanced architect. And then, you know, for a few weeks, you might be working on an entirely different project with a different architect. So that kind of uh, avoids burnout and, you know, having one person uh, be so focused on, on one thing that it kind of becomes monotonous for them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, it's, it's a trade off for them, right? Because the smart firms will do that. They'll keep you um, working on different types of projects to keep you interested, but you're probably most profitable working on uh, the stuff you know best. So it, it, you, it's something, you know, if you, if you end up in architecture and you, you, uh, you go to a certain firm, that's definitely something you should should ask like when when you have an interview is like how do you structure your teams or what's in terms of uh, like how do you ensure that uh, your employees are uh, professionally developed and fulfilled in their work and if they say well we we have them do the same thing every day <laughs> then run run for the hills yeah and I guess there's some people that do actually know that they want to do something very specific for example there's some architecture programs that have, you know, attached master's degrees or special specializations in, for example, like green building or, you know, historic preservation, where they just take old buildings and turn them into luxury lofts or, you know, some people actually enjoy that. They, they know that that's what they want to do. They want to focus on that forever. And, you know, they might even get into it um, for the next 30, 40 years. Other people are more kind of, they just are interested in the idea of designing space. And they don't necessarily care if it's like, you know, a small little shack or, you know, a 300 unit um, tower. So, yeah, those are all those are all things that are very personal decisions. And like Sean said in the beginning, a lot of people go into architecture or the design profession, not really knowing where they're going to end up or how they're going to come out of it. I knew a guy who was an architect. Um, I think he was at, at SciArc too. And he, after school, just kind of totally went into like the CGI world. And he was actually responsible for designing all the firearms in the Men in Black series. So like all the hmm. space age kind of like, you know, ray guns and the different kinds of, uh, you know, fake firearms that they had for the, yeah. for, the, for the aliens and for the Men in Black. So that's like no one going into architecture would think, oh, I'm going to like work at Universal and make fake firearms for a movie with Will Smith. But that's where he ended up and he made a lot of money doing it. Um, yeah. So well, and I think, I think also, um, I mean, I would caution because I, I definitely have had students who are like, I only want to work on healthcare um, and stuff like that. I and love I, hospitals. <laughs> yeah. Well, usually it's not healthcare, but uh, I think I would say, you know, uh, keeping with the idea that it's uh, your career path isn't necessarily like something that you control. Um, I think I would just recommend that everybody be flexible, right? Like if you really love sustainable design, that's great. Uh, but all design should be sustainable and don't pigeonhole yourself by getting a very specialized degree. You know, like I actually, uh, just to, to point, it, point that out, I, after two years in uh, kind of working with other firms in DC, I was like, you know what? Uh, maybe I want to try something different. So I applied to, uh, to school to go do furniture design. Um, and luckily, I, there was a, 
Um, that's a whole nother story, but I didn't get into the program that I was trying to get into. And in retrospect, thank God I didn't because with an architecture degree, I can certainly design furniture, but you can't design architecture with a furniture degree. Yeah, that's true. It's a little bit top down. So if you know how to do everything, then you can do anything. <laughs> Isan, do you want to um, field questions from your students or? I actually just did in the chat. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, what are, uh, one, Armando has a question. What are the most effective strategies for seeking a position in architecture? Uh, can you clear up, Armando, what you mean by that? As in after you've already gotten your degree and you're trying to get a job at like your first job at a firm? Is that what you mean? Kind of like the interview and all that process? Yes, that's what he's talking about. So right. let's say let's say you have a degree, you're going into the market, and you know what do you think is the most effective way to maybe build connections in the industry and actually get your first job? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, you know, there are a lot of architects in LA, but it's still a very small world, and so um, probably the best way uh, to ensure you get a job is to um, to meet a lot of architects along the way, meet as many as you can. Uh, because I would say that, um, you know, there, there are definitely times like if an architecture firm is, uh, needs help and they're hiring uh, that they could, you know, we, uh, you would go and uh, post something on Archonnect or something like that. But I'd say at least 50% uh, of hires are probably from referrals, right? So the, uh, my old bosses would always, if they, if we needed uh, more people, the first thing would, would be like in a staff meeting to say, uh, does anybody know anybody who is looking for work or, um, you know, who's really good and we should steal from another firm, <laughs> for example. <laughs> uh, but it's, I would say that uh, maybe more than other professions, architects tend to be uh, a, a pretty tight knit community. And I would say that recommendations mean the most. So, um, yeah, it's tough because you, you have to kind of get that first contact and, um, you know, hopefully kind of through Asan's uh, program and kind of the outreach and the site visits and things like that, you guys will uh, build some contacts because that's definitely the best way. Um, also, I mean, the, the portfolio is huge, right? Basically, you have to get your foot in the door, but then once you do, uh, if you don't have a portfolio that's impressive and kind of hits the right points, then um, then your your interview isn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, um, I agree. But uh, you know, I think also what I what I always tell my students at the LAID is um, usually the way that you build those contacts is through school. So when someone tells me like, oh, I I want to go to school in New York, but then I want to move back to LA and uh, and work here. Like if you go to school in New York and then come back to Los Angeles to try to find a job, you're going to be in a much worse position because when you go to, to grad school or undergrad, uh, you're going to meet professors and those professors, a lot of professors will, will basically hire students as interns. And then that's, that's really a great way to, to start building your network is work for architects while you're in school. Also, I would say, don't ever work for free. <laughs> There's some some architects who take advantage again, uh, kind of back on the theme of uh, of uh, getting taken taken advantage of by older architects. But it's not legal to to ask you to work for free. So try to make sure you're getting compensated. But that is a, a huge side benefit to uh, to working for somebody while you're in school is that you have that contact and then they know other architects. As long as you're you work hard and you're thoughtful, you know, then that's, that's basically how you're going to build your network. Sean, let me say, cause I know that you said not working for free, but in high school, like, so some of the students, I know that Bryce just asked about um, internships at your firm, um, but <laughs> high school students, I almost, cause we've had high school students go and put their resume out there and get, get internships, just getting that foot in the door and building their resume. So even yeah. if you're not, assisting you like they're doing you know filing or just being in that environment is really great so yeah for high school students i i think that's fine for high school students um i think it's uh that is you know it's more like you're you're in this during the summer i'm talking more about like if especially when you have a degree like if you have an undergrad degree 
yeah. or a grad degree and someone says like oh well you know you and this happens mostly with like the star architects the ones that are published or do competitions a lot of times they take advantage and they say well it's an it's an honor for you to work here so i'm not going to pay you it's more that's the part that i take umbrage with is uh like firms that can pay people but they don't because they're you know they're not efficient with their design or they're um they're just taking advantage of them. so it's i think it's fine uh to do that in, in high school maybe to a limited degree when when you're in school uh, but yeah i just that's that's a part of a kind of a legacy of the architectural profession that i don't agree with and luckily a lot of people are um are speaking out about that now a lot of interns if they're getting taken advantage of will you know post on social media and, and say this is this is not right yeah i i agree with with sean and i think what he's getting at is that you know sometimes people come into a job with skills that are helping the business owner make money and so if you're coming with skills that help the business owner make money you should be compensated even if it's minimum wage you know and you have a college degree you need to be paid something um but a situation in which you're a high school student or you're still in college and you just recently graduated from high school, you don't really, you know, like you might know a few software here and there, but at that point, the business is almost kind of taking patronage and being like, okay, you know what, we're gonna waste money teaching you how to be effective for our business. So as an intern, as a high school student or as a college student being an intern, you know, those of you who are smart, who are actually working and trying to build those connections as soon as possible, they're, they're actually kind of just expanding your educational experience through practice. You know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna sit you here with an older architect who's been working for maybe five, 10 years, and he's gonna show you what kind of things that we do and you know, how you can actually be effective. And, and honestly, that's great because a lot of those even free internship situations might turn into paid situations because once you're there for a month, two months, three months, they start saying, wow, this kid's like building models. He's finishing these drawings, he's doing this, that, like we kind of feel bad not paying this kid after six months. So like here, here's 15 bucks an hour. And then that might translate to 30 bucks an hour. And then all of, all of a sudden you have a real job. So and that has happened. We've had yeah. cases where that's happened. Yeah. It happens all the time. I worked for an architect in Culver city. His name is Zoltan <laughs> SPFA. He didn't, he's, he doesn't even have, an architecture degree to be honest with you he studied fine arts at ucla but he did become a registered architect because in california you can just kind of take the test and become one but he was the same kind of situation you know he, he was an artist kind of got into architecture through various mentors and you know 20 years later now he's like a big architect so yeah. that's something to, to think about connections you know being active trying to learn making yourself useful to people who are making money is pretty much the the best way to move forward. We have another question um, from Matteo and he says, you mentioned as an architect, you work with engineers. Can you clarify how that works? What is the relationship between architects and engineers in the work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I've had, uh, I've had clients before say, you know, not, not smart clients, but <laughs> say, okay, so let me get this right. There's a structural engineer uh, a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, a plumbing engineer. Uh, sometimes we have a lighting designer and they say, they would say, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, th that's a great point because it goes to the generalist idea, right? A generalist it knows a little bit about everything. And that's really our job as, uh, as the architect is first, we, we have this uh, ridiculous, uh, audacious position where we're saying, okay, you have this piece of land or this tenant space and out of the infinite, and you have a program, but that program can put, put, be put together in myriad different ways. And basically as, as an architect, you define uh, what, what we're gonna build, right? So nobody else is gonna say, there are plenty of other people who are gonna give you advice on how you should build it, uh, but nobody is gonna say, oh, you should build, this is what you should build, right? So we define what the idea is, and then when we work with engineers, we have to make them understand how their work fits in with the idea. So almost every engineer is going to want to do things exactly the way he did the last time. So they, they don't want to innovate. They want to do something that they know works, which is understandable, right? And you need to have that expertise on your team. But as an architect, you need to be able to tell the, uh, the mechanical engineer no, you can't use 
a flat rectangular duct, you have to use a round duct because that works better with the idea. And you have to be able to tell the plumbing engineer, no, you can't run that waistline over here and down that wall because that wall uh, is gonna basically be all glass. So you are in charge of taking all of these engineers who have blinders on, all they see is their work, right? And they're, that's fine, they're supposed to, they're specialists. You have to give them direction, uh, even when, you, when they know more about their trade than, than you will ever know, you have to tell them, I understand that that's a more efficient way to do it, but we're gonna do it like this because it works better with the idea. Um, so you do have to know uh, a little bit, enough to, to not, um, you know, not say something that's impossible, but you have to know a little bit about mechanical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, plumbing, how structures work. Uh, so we, we basically are the generalist that is kind of conducting these, uh, this orchestra of specialists. If that yeah, makes there's sense. a piggyback question on that as well. He says, is it at all possible to be both an engineer and architect at the same time? And I, I believe it is. Um, oh, there's, sure. There's examples of that, like uh, Calatrava out of Spain. He's a very famous, uh, originally was an engineer doing bridges and stuff, and then he moved into architecture. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of examples of even schools that have an architectural engineering degree in which you are basically like set up to be both a structural engineer and an architect at the same time and be able to get both licenses. Uh, my cousin is actually that. She has an architectural license and she has a um, contracting license and she's a registered architect. So she has all three. Um, so, so, so she's yeah. just yelling at herself all the time. Yeah, exactly. Like she, I guess she was just kind of done dealing with anybody and she just wanted to make a bunch of money on her own. So that's, that's kind of like yeah. how she does her, her practice. Sure. Um, but no, no one to blame. But yeah, of course. I mean, you can do any of that stuff. I would say, um, the one thing I would, I would, um, uh, I would put on that though, is sometimes the mindset of an engineer and the mindset of an architect are different. And actually, um, I would say that this, a lot of offices actually uh, kind of separate the what I would call the front end, uh, like the, the the conceptual people, and the back end, like the the Technical. design, development, and construction document people. Because it's kind of it's you have to if you want to do both, you have to have two types of brains, right? Because when you're trying to generate an idea for a project, if all you're thinking about is oh, what size beam is that going to be, or oh, this is really going to be hard to get a duct in here then you're probably not going to come up with any, uh, any idea that has uh, significance beyond just this, its parts. Um, so you have to have some kind of vision about how to make something that's more than just the sum of its parts. But, uh, and in the back end, uh, you never want to leave anything that is not defined, right? I, there was actually, when I was at SOM, there was, I witnessed a conversation between a design guy and a a technical guy and the design guy, he, the technical guy asked the design guy, he was like, what is this dash line on the plan? And the design guy said, well, it's, it's some sort of datum. It's like, uh, he didn't know what it was yet, but it was an idea. And the technical guy was like, that's ridiculous. How can you draw a line on the plan that you don't know what it is? So as long as you can switch between the, those two mindsets, sure, you can do both, but it's, it's a, it's a tough thing to do to be able to uh, turn off your left brain and use your right brain and then switch back and forth. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I guess that's all the questions. I think there were, there were some students who raised their hands. I was just kind of privately messaging if, if anyone wanted to ask a question, um, they could either unmute themselves or ask it in the chat. And uh, yeah, my my goal really, I know Sean, I says, I'm not to put you on the spot, but really is to build this pathway out to provide internships for second year students. Um, not maybe for the whole class, but we want to start and moving in that direction. I know that some schools really already do with their pathways. Um, so it's just finding the right fit and finding the right firms that can actually take on maybe an office assistant or something just to be in that environment. I think it's really, really helpful for the student and for you, you know, to maybe some things that, that you can have a student do while in high school or for a certain year college. Sure. Yeah, I think um, I, we might have talked about this in the, in the pathway meetings. Yeah. Um, so 
the the challenge to architectural internships is you're you're also going to be competing with um, uh, students in school, right? So uh, who are ba basically in an undergrad program. Um, so I think it's probably uh, might be more realistic to kind of like you say maybe it's an office assistant or yeah. something like that. Um, and you know we uh, my partner and I it's just the two of us and we literally are our office at WeWork that we haven't been to for three and a half months is literally five feet by 10 feet. Uh, <laughs> and our workload, our work is down probably 50% right now. So uh, right. we don't really need an assistant, uh, but you know, in, in the coming years, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be back up and running and we might, you know, who knows, maybe we'll upgrade to that three person office at WeWork and have a, a, some space for, for somebody to help out. <laughs> And there are other larger architecture firms in the area. I know that. So we oh, there are there are so many architects in Culver City. You can't you can't swing a cat without hitting one. So I mean, there are definitely some good opportunities. But also, you know, um, the the other thing is like a lot of architects live in Culver City, and so you know, talk to your parents about do we know any architects or just you know. Um, I know it's tough to talk to old people sometimes, but um, you know, having a personal connection to an architect, if you if you want to become an architect, is going to be huge. You know, mentors, mentors are are uh, an invaluable resource. Yeah, me me and Adrian have talked about this quite often, and we haven't really got to it yet. But maybe you can also be involved in this. And Patty is also interested in being involved in it from EYR. Yes. She's also part of the um, executive advisory board. And we're, we're thinking about starting like a, just an archive or database of all the architecture companies, big and small in Culver City. And, you know, we, the program is pretty new, but we're thinking about just creating that communication with all of them and then reaching out kind of maybe towards the end of the school year or um, every year to all of them and being like, hey, do you guys have any opportunities? Do you guys need any, would you be interested in this or that? When, in this student and that student. And, and so that's, you know, kind of where we're thinking of going because some of the programs in the CTE structure, they're actually three years. So the idea is that the students start as, as early as freshman or sophomore year, and then they have two, two years of instruction and in the last year, they participate in an internship either after school or they even leave school early and do it like a sixth period every day and go, that to, would like, be awesome. yeah. Yeah, go to some business, you know, so there'll be an architecture three and it's basically just me advising them while they work almost, you know, part time somewhere else with, with a business that has, you know, a relationship with the school. Yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of where we're envisioning it to go. You know, the program is only three years old and we're, we're kind of building it as we go, but but that I think I think that would be instrumental for students, whether they go in architecture or not, to have some you know experience working in an office with professionals in, instead of being in class. Yeah. Well, I think uh, one way you could potentially spin that too is, you know, the um, we don't enter competitions, but a lot of architects do. Uh, and when you enter a competition, usually you're not getting paid for it. Uh, and that, you know, yeah, you're burning money, you're, you're burning hours on something that might not lead to anything. Right. And that, that leads to the exploitation I was talking about, but you could maybe couch it as a, uh, a more ethical way to get free labor. And it's kind of, usually they're, you know, uh, constrained periods of time. It's like you work on a competition for a month. So if basically you say like, Hey, we have all these students there. Hassan has trained them to be great at Rhino you know, by, by the time they're in their second or third year or something like that, you know, we have this resource for you guys and you don't have to violate labor laws to take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. So basically just make them your like competition team, you know, just let yeah. them, let them run loose because you're not losing any, you're not losing anything out of it anyway. That could, that could be an interesting idea. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to, to be involved uh, in, in whatever way I'd be useful. Cool. Sounds good. Um, Diego asked something about a, about a degree. Is there? I know that you had talked about other paths, but again, working on a two-year degree, can you get a similar job with a two-year degree or, or trade school kind of certificate versus a four-year degree or math? versus a five? Yeah, versus a yeah. five degree. So maybe explain the explain a little bit of the the academic um, trajectory. Sure. Well, um, so again, uh, kind of talking about maybe how the um, 
the California Architects Board and the AIA haven't necessarily been making it, well, they've been making it more difficult to become an architect because they're trying to protect their members, right? So it used to be in the state of California, and maybe this is what Zoltan did, is that if you uh, worked for an architect or with an architect for, I think it was 10 or 12 years, that you could just then go and take the test, right? There was no IDP requirement, but uh, yeah. if you want to be licensed in the state of California, and I'm pretty sure this is true in every 50 states, you need to have a, a, an NAAB accredited professional degree uh, in order to, to become a licensed architect. Uh, and I would I would suggest that's the way you should go. But there there are other ways, you know, there are ways to get there that are maybe less expensive. Like, uh, for example, our uh, the school where both Isan and I teach LAID, uh, we offer like a two year introductory program, and we have uh, NAAB accreditation through West LA College. And basically, then so you could uh, we have relationships with schools like Woodbury uh, and. I think we're working on SciArc and, and others that you could essentially transfer in if your portfolio was up to snuff. Uh, you know, all of this is predicated on, on being uh, a really hard worker and having a great portfolio, but you could potentially transfer into the third year of a five-year program uh, and you wouldn't be paying a, as much for those first two years. Um, but in terms of becoming a, a registered architect, you have to have a professional degree, whether that's the five-year bachelor's or uh, a master's. But uh, if you wanted to, uh, <laughs> if you wanted to get a um, a degree in something else, like a bachelor's degree, maybe you're interested in, I don't know, uh, animals. So you get a, a biology degree undergrad, but then you you decide to go to architecture. The the master's of architecture after you have a bachelor's in anything else is only three years. So, um, you know, but they're, they're trying to make it so that everybody who gets licensed as an architect has been through accredited architecture school. Okay. Well, if there's any other questions, um, and, and we're over, to, we're way over time, but thank you okay. so much. My pleasure for giving us um, a really good presentation um, about architecture and what you do. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, and if, if anybody has other follow-ups, Asan has my contact info, so if you send him questions, uh, I'm happy to, okay. happy to continue to be a resource. Great, oh, yeah. and this uh, will be posted on our website, college, under the College and Career Center on the high school website, so. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Sean. Okay. Um, Adrian, uh, is there any way I can get a list of all the students who, who joined for